Amen. Amen. So turn over with me now, if you don't mind, and flip over to 1 John, if you're not still there. And we're going to continue our exposition. And really, this is part two of the text that we are have been studying the last couple of weeks, namely 1 John verses 1, or chapter 1, verse 5, to chapter 2, verse 2. And I want to prompt the men. If you can give me my uh, PowerPoint in the back, I'll know where we are so I can follow along. Uh, otherwise, I'll be turning around. Or you can just tell me where. Thank you. You have it. Now I have it. And now we can move on in unison together. This is part two, considering uh, this text. And namely, the, the idea being that we need to stop pretending. We've come into God's light. His light exposes us. And we need to see the implications, what it means that we would live in God's light. And... With that in mind, I was reminded of this story that I'd heard about from Charles Spurgeon. Now, it's been said that a lot of stories go out about Charles Spurgeon. And maybe there's going to be a long line in heaven of all these preachers apologizing to him for telling him these false stories about him. Nevertheless, here's the story. Once a man had told Spurgeon that this man was without sin, and Spurgeon invited the man home for dinner and listened over the meal as the man repeated his sinless claim over and over. Suddenly, Spurgeon reached for a glass of water and threw it in the man's face. It caught the visitor by surprise, and he was very angry and expressed his anger in terms no Christian should use. And then Spurgeon said quietly, Ah, you see, the old man within you is not dead. He had simply fainted and could be revived with a glass of water. <laughs> And though the details of this story I've been not able to verify, this kind of false teaching is real. It was real in Spurgeon's day. He mentions in his autobiography, the younger Spurgeon mentions confronting such characters advocating this kind of teaching. It's still around in our own day, particularly in a whole branch of Wesleyan theology. And surely in many less aware that is less sophisticated forms in many churches and many believers' hearts, maybe even a temptation for us this morning. And we've heard from our scripture reading, as we just read in 1 John, it was around in the earliest days of the church, really this falsehood that we have no sin. But how does someone get there? How does someone come to that conclusion, so fool themselves into thinking that they've progressed so far along, supposedly, in the Christian life, to now be sinless, sinlessly perfect? Now, there could be many factors, I think, in anyone's life, but I think a common root for many is this. It stems from this truth, really, that we looked at last time, as we considered the perfect character of our God, that God is light. And in Him, there is no darkness at all. He is just pure, untainted light. And frankly, if we get close to this God, as we talked about, if we come in close fellowship with this God, things just get uncomfortable. Because God's perfect light truly shows us what we're like. And it exposes us, if we'll even consider it. And so time and again come up these perpetual reminders that I have no right to be here. I have no just claim to say I can know God. So how do we deal with our sin? What should we do when we've been exposed with God's light? Well, for millennia, apparently it's been a temptation and a trap to try and pretend. Just try and pretend that we actually haven't sinned in one way or the other. Or we ignore our sin. Or we just try not to think about it. Or we redefine, recategorize our sins into less, <coughs> into less offensive categories. All the while thinking... If I can make God's holiness not quite so holy, or if I can make my sins not quite so sinful, then my conscience will feel better. I will have some assurance that indeed I have a right to heaven to fellowship with God. And the trouble is, as we see in this text, that's just a lie. A dangerous one at that. Because it's one that fails to see, first, the pure light of God's holiness. And then to see the utter darkness of our sinfulness. And how great and massive that gap is, that chasm between them, between us and God. Because that person who fails to see this will never really see or appreciate how desperately they need a Savior. How, and they'll fail to see how gloriously sufficient and abundantly able Jesus Christ is to save. 
we rob him of his glory. We rob ourselves of real assurance found in Christ, not in us. And then we undercut nearly any opportunity for real growth, real repentance, real conformity to Christ because we'd rather hide in the dark behind a veneer-like righteousness, fake fellowship with God. As we turn to 1 John, this is what this text is confronting us with this morning. And John gives us a better hope, a better answer that's in the gospel. He says, if we could summarize it, enjoy a genuine relationship with God, a real one, true fellowship. But that comes as you are exposed before God's light to be seen as you really are. But then at the same time, that light directs you to a glorious Savior, a all-sufficient, most capable Savior. And to see the text unfold, it looks like this. So we saw last week in verse 5, and I adapted the outline, I think, just to try and make it simpler for all of us to follow along. But verse 5 is this summary truth about God's character. What's he like? God is light. This is what we learn about him. In him, there's no darkness at all. So if we have a relationship with, if we have a fellowship with a God like this, it has implications for our, for our lives. And we see those unfold in verse 6 of the first chapter all the way to verse 2 in the second chapter. And in short, we must then walk in His light. We must live in His light if we really do know this God. So God is light and we live with Him and then accordingly that creates these implications for our life. It has an impact on how we walk and so He highlights three things really confronting these false teachings. So we need to stop pretending that first. That's where we ended last time. Sin doesn't matter. If we're exposed by God's light, we need to stop pretending that sin doesn't matter. Because it does. It's an indicator of where we stand with God. Second, we'll start this morning, we need to stop pretending that sin isn't a struggle. If we're really exposed by God's light, we need to stop pretending that sin is not a struggle. And then finally, we need to stop pretending that sin hasn't been done. If we really live in the light of God, we need to be open before Him. And that's the only way that we will see how holy He really is and how great our Savior truly is. So, with no further ado, as we prepare to come now to the Lord's table, let us go on and work back. And so we're going to come to this. We need to stop pretending that sin isn't a struggle. We need to stop pretending sin isn't a struggle. This is the second implication as we think about what does our fellowship with God mean? What does it mean as we are exposed by His light? We need to stop pretending that sin isn't a struggle. Stop falsely portraying that we are super Christians. You know, that don't feel this internal battle and struggle against the sin of our hearts. The implication being, that's normal for the Christian life, to struggle. Despite what some false teachers or so-called super-Christians might want you to think. As we walk in fellowship with God, we must pretend sin's not a struggle. Verses 8 and 9. So as verse 8 begins of chapter 1, we counter that second false claim made by these false teachers. These, this attempt by these false teachers to belittle, to downgrade sin. Verse 8, if we say, so again this is that trigger that we at first hear the false teacher. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If someone's claiming Christ, if they claim to know God, and they also claim to have no sin, then you need to know they're self-deceived. The truth is not in them. They're portraying this alternative reality, this virtual reality that is what? It's no reality at all. But what precisely do these false teachers mean when they say we have no sin? This is a peculiar expression in the New Testament. Only John uses it, or he does so quoting Jesus. And to help clue us in what it means to have no sin, I want to bring up another reference to it, the same language in John's writings. It happens in a couple times, but I'm going to look at one. You can flip there or just listen closely. But John chapter 15, verse 22, from the Gospel of John. 15, verse 22. These are Jesus' words, and here's what Jesus says. He says, If I had not come and spoken to them, the Jewish leaders, they would not have been guilty of sin. Now that's the same language originally that we have that says have sin in our text. He says, they would not have been guilty of sin or have sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. 
to have your sin, sin still with you. To have your sin in John means to be guilty of it. To have an abiding guilt before God that you are culpable. Your sin sticks with you and all its trappings and all its abiding guilt, everything that comes with it, along with its temptations to further evil. This is what it means to have sin. It clarifies for us what we're looking at here in 1 John. They say, we have no sin. They're saying, I don't see any sin in my life. I don't have any guilt before God because I don't have any sin before Him. You know, I generally do pretty well. I typically do the right thing. And even these little mess-ups I may have, they're not really sins. They're just momentary lapses, mistakes. But I don't have real sin anymore. I've progressed in God well beyond that. I'm a pretty good person now and praise God for it. Sin just really isn't much a struggle anymore. And John's response to that kind of thinking is sobering as it is jarring. To say you have no guilt before God because you really do not sin all that much means then he says we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we don't think we struggle with sin anymore, we've only fooled ourselves. We're self-deceived. We haven't come to the light. We don't see the truth. And this is the terrifying thing. If we don't think we struggle still with sin, if we deny that we have any sin, then we deny that we need a Savior from them. Do you see how this goes? And if we don't need a Savior, then why do we need Jesus? Now notice how then John, this faithful apostle and pastor, comes and gives the gospel truth that confronts this lie. We look here in verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So instead of saying, in contrast, right, instead of saying, we have no sins, what is the gospel response? Oh, we confess them. Oh, we have them. That's why we come to Him. Instead of saying we have no sins, the gospel response is to confess our sins. We come out of the flattering lie that sin has nothing on us, and we own that. We let God's light expose us and reveal our sin and ourselves before God. And we confess, we agree with God that these are indeed sins. Damnable hell sins. Failures of obedience, failures in motives, failures in attitudes. These are wrong. We are in the wrong. We are guilty before God. We are justly to be punished, condemned by Him. This is what it means to confess our sins before God. And if you ponder that even for a moment, of course this is terrifying. If we can hold in our mind just for a moment what it would mean to stand guilty before the Almighty, to be condemned, thrown away, cast away from Him in our rebellion. I mean, I don't even want to think about that for myself or for anyone. And it seems like if I don't think about it, it just goes away. You know, some of us are afraid to go to the doctor because what the doctor might discover. And it's as if, if I don't go to the doctor, I don't get diagnosed, and so I don't have the problem. If I never get the blood tested, I can never be confirmed to have diabetes. But of course, that's not how it works, is it? That's only self-deception. The doctor doesn't give you diabetes. He only observes what's going on in your body. Some of us try and do the same thing with sin. If we just don't think about it, it's not there, and we don't have any guilt with God. But diabetes or cancer can kill you whether you know you have it or not. Just like sin. And here's where, though, the gospel comes in. Because as the very light of God exposes us, shows us our sin, that same light points us the way that sin can actually be dealt with fully and really. Again, verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. See then, because of Christ, to discover you are a sinner by God's mercy is not actually a cause for despair. Now why not? 
It should be, you would think, in light of God's judgment. Why not? Because every sin in you that is exposed or shown, Christ has a perfect and sufficient answer for everyone. If we would only be those that see and confess. Be ones to humble ourselves before God. And see and say, I need you, Jesus. I can't. I can't, but you can. Those are the ones that find forgiveness and cleansing. Those that know they need it. And those that see that there's no other answer but Jesus. Because notice with me something about verse 9. Perhaps it's a very familiar verse to you. Many of us have memorized it before. I have often long misread this verse to say this. It's an if-then statement, which is a condition, right? So if this is true, then this becomes true. And so if you look at the text, this is how I misread it in my mind. If this is true, namely that I confess my sins to God, then the consequence is God forgives me. I confess, then he forgives. But that's not precisely how the language works here in John. Notice what's happening here. It runs a little bit differently. He says this, If this is true that I confess my sins, what is the then? What's the consequence? What am I demonstrating or showing? Look at verse 9. Before the whole forgiveness thing comes, what happens? If I confess my sins, then what? He is faithful and just. That's the part of the confession. Now what does this mean? By implication it means this. When I confess my sins to God, I'm not earning forgiveness with Him. As if my relationship with Him is some tit-for-tat thing. I sin, I confess, I'm back with Him. I sin, I confess, I'm back with Him. That's not how it works. As if He only forgives me on how articulate I become in seeing my sins and naming them. Our relationship with God, thankfully, doesn't work like that. He's forgiven us in Christ because Jesus died for all my sins, not because I'm an excellent confessor of them. You see the difference? Remember the story of Martin Luther in the confessional booth when he was still a, a monk? He'd spend hours and hours confessing every minor sin in detail, even frustrating his superiors who once demanded, Luther, go and really do something. Commit some heinous sin, then come back here, but don't come back till then. Because at that time, monk Martin thought his forgiveness rested on him. But no, that's not how our relationship with God could possibly work. That's the truth of this text. Rather, our confession is an expression of faith, trust in the character of God that we've come to see in His light. Namely this, that He is faithful and He is a just God. Now that might seem a bit counterintuitive. It does to me at first. Why would I be encouraged to discover that God is faithful and just? Especially just. I think that's where the problem comes. See, because of my sin, I don't want justice, right? I don't want justice from God. That would be punishment, hell in the end. Actually, it's because of God's justice that I want to hide from Him. That's where we started to begin with. But now look at what John clarifies about God, that He's faithful and just to do. Verse 9. If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. What? Did you read that right? See how the blood of Christ mentioned in the verse before? Has this changed everything? He is faithful and just to do what? To forgive and to cleanse. That's the example of His faithfulness and justice. See, the cross of Christ has changed everything. That God is now actually just in releasing your sins from you. That's His faithfulness. He's being faithful to His Word, His promises, to forgive sinners that look for life and forgiveness in Jesus. So much so that because of the cross, for God not to forgive, for, for Him not to forgive the sinners that look to Christ for mercy, if He wouldn't forgive in that case, that would be unfaithful. That would make God a liar. And that would make God unjust. 
To not forgive in Christ would upend His Word and the Gospel promise itself. Like, of course, John 3.16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whoever believes in Him should not perish but have eternal life. That becomes untrue and makes God a liar if He does not forgive the sinner that hopes in Jesus. And so can you feel the implications of this? Once you discover and see your sin. Our fleshly, knee-jerk, gospel-deficient reaction is to try and hide it. It's to try to conceal it, cover it up, run away from it. Redefine things. Just pull over the veil of darkness. But the gospel calls us to something, something better. See, because that kind of reaction, veiling over the darkness, only projects a false understanding of God and the gospel. That's what we're getting at here. That reaction pro projects a God, when we veil our sin, projects a God who is not gracious and forgiving. Who, a God who cannot be merciful, at least to sins like these that I've done. And hiding our struggle with sin also shows to the world and to one another a gospel that is no gospel at all. It's not good news at all. It projects a gospel that denies Jesus actually died for those sins. Hence, they can't be uncovered. Because we become most afraid that we still need to pay the punishment for them. That's why deep down we still hide them. But the sinner that sees his sin, confesses it, turning from it, that sinner proclaims a robust faith in the saving power of Christ. To be more specific, verse 9, it proclaims a trust in a God that will be faithful to His Word, a Word that promises to look at the ungodly and call them righteous because of Jesus, period. If we stay in the darkness and portray sin as not a struggle, that we don't have any guilt... We deceive ourselves, and we have a radical misunderstanding of the gospel. Thinking that God only saves the perfect, that He only saves the righteous. Only saving those who help themselves. Or most tragically, we just demonstrate a radical disbelief in God. That the promises of the gospel are a farce, they are false. He will not be faithful, He will not forgive. So what do, you do, what do we do with this? We don't run from His light. Yeah, His light that exposes you, exposes you in your sin. Because that same light points you to Christ, who to the great glory and praise of God will forgive it all, brothers and sisters. Cleanse it all. So stop pretending. Come to His light. Find a faithful God who forgives in Christ. So we stop pretending sin is a struggle. And just even in a similar way, but a little bit different angle, we stop pretending sin hasn't been done. We stop pretending that sin hasn't been done. This is the third implication of our life with God. Given that He is God, He is light, and we're in relationship with Him. And again, this is similar to what we saw just a moment ago, but it has a little bit different emphasis here. So there were some false teachers saying they no longer struggle with any sin. They no longer have this ongoing battle with it in their heart. Others were even more boldly proclaiming they'd never even committed any sin. Sin had never been done. And John confronts this lie, this lie, and he's calling us to the same and saying we need to stop pretending that we haven't sinned. Verse 10. If we say, again, cluing into the, the words of the false teacher here, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. These teachers actually have the audacity to say, we have not sinned. They've kept themselves supposedly in the state of sinless perfection. They have no sin, they have no guilt, they have no culpability with God. And so then the most tragic thing is, as we mentioned, they don't even see any need for a Savior, do they? Why would they? They have nothing to be saved from. They have no sins before God. No just punishment coming. Why do they need Jesus? Now again, the audacious thing for you may be thinking this. How in the world could somebody be so blind, so self-righteous, so convoluted in their moral thinking that they thought they had never sinned? I mean, even in our common expression, we say to err is human. 
Everyone knows they have sinned at least a little, right? Well, if you go and talk to people on the street, I'm always surprised about how many people think fundamentally that they are a good person. And maybe you're there even this morning, if you haven't been there. They, for all practical purposes, do not think that they have sinned. And in part because they want to define sin by the, usually the most egregious acts that you can imagine. You know, the classic response, I'm a pretty good person, I haven't murdered anybody. As if that's the standard of what the, you know, the lowest bar of what good is. We lower the bar of God's holiness and purity to assure ourselves, yeah, we're going to heaven, we're not going to hell. Because we presume God has to grade on a curve, right? Otherwise, everybody gets an F. That couldn't be. And we redefine our sins all the time to escape conviction, to keep hiding our sins in the dark. Adultery becomes an affair. Stealing becomes fraud. Anger becomes frustration. Thanklessness, yeah, that sin becomes impolite. Overall, sin becomes a little more than an undesirable habit. You know, probably something you should refrain from doing, but not something that's actually wrong, immoral, evil, evil. Certainly not something that would warrant hell. And so we buy the lie. No. He was talking about something else. He was talking about sin. And, and that's just not what this is. I haven't sinned. And that kind of thinking, as John points out here, is more than faulty or errant. It's evil. Notice how the Apostle John assesses it. Verse 10 again. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar. And his word is not in us. If we dare claim that we have not sinned, though God's word clearly says we have, we are not simply in error. We are blasphemers slandering God. John bids us here, come into the fellowship of God's light. To be open with Him about your sins, even about your past, your rebellion, your heinous tendencies. We are all sinners. But there's hope here, even yet. Look now at chapter 2. My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. If that wasn't evident already. But here he comes with one of those purpose statements of the letter we talked about in the introduction to the book. And as you keep reading this power-punched, no gray area kind of book, it becomes much more obvious even still. He's trying to keep us away from sin. But being a wise pastor and a good shepherd, with all of that said, he knows the temptation for us to despair. The great discouragement that it comes, probably especially to those who love Jesus most, when they find sin in their life. Do you know that feeling? They are the ones usually most pained by it when they're confronted with great sin. And in that sense, all sin is great. And so as sin is found in us to battle that despair, John points us to these glorious gospel truths that answer our despair, that answer our sin problem with hope. So instead of pretending you've not sinned, staying in the darkness with no hope, he gives the colossal gospel hope in these words as it just begins, if anyone does sin. I'm writing these things so you wouldn't sin, but here we go, if anyone does. There's hope for sinners here in this book. Let's keep reading verse 1. But if anyone does sin, we have, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. So if you find yourself this morning to be a sinner, you find yourself walking in darkness, too much darkness, you find sin present in your heart or evident in your past, do not attempt to calm your conscience with false hopes of, I promise to do better. Or vain attempts to pretend your sin really isn't that bad. That's not the answer. Because that's looking at you. You see how this works? This gospel call, where does he point you? He doesn't say, oh, you'll get better in time. He says, we have an advocate who does it in your place. This is the gospel hope. 
to look outside yourself and your sin and look to Jesus as your only hope. If anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. I wish we had time to spend so much more on this, but let's highlight a few things as we come to the Lord's table. What do we see about our Jesus here first? He is an advocate. He's an intercessor, a mediator. He is the one who brings us to be at peace, reconciled to God, despite how big and huge, how massive that chasm is between us and between Him, between our sin and His pure light. He bridges that gap entirely. He comes to our rescue. He makes peace. And He does so pleading on our behalf before the Father. In Jesus Christ, believing sinners have a more than sufficient advocate for their defense. He never loses a case. His clients, every time, hear innocent, righteous, proclaimed at the judgment. And why is that? Well, because he is a, secondly, a righteous advocate. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. When you see your sin, I think you have to ask the question, what could Jesus possibly say to make me at peace with God? Well, here's what he says. He pleads his righteousness in your place. Again, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. While we have all kinds of unrighteousness, our, our unrighteousness is eclipsed by His righteous life. His righteous life that's given to us, counted to us, so that we are indeed cleansed, seen by the Father only through that righteousness. As Paul puts it in Philippians chapter 3, he says, That I may gain Christ and be found in Him, not having a righteousness that's my own. Again, we're looking outside ourselves. That comes from the law. But that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God. That perfectly exacting light of God's holiness in law is met perfectly, entirely, with Christ's righteous life given to you. That righteous life given to you, that's as good as if you had lived it right before the Father's face. What a glorious and perfect Savior we have in Jesus. And He's able to give us His righteousness. He's able to be this perfect advocate because third, He is the propitiation for our sins. He is the propitiation for our sins. Verse 2. He is the propitiation for our sins. Most basically, this word propitiation means a satisfaction of wrath. A satisfaction of wrath. And I think we get this. Especially if we have been trying to hide our sin, right? The punishment for sin is death. One day it will be physical death. But that's going to give way to full spiritual ongoing death in the torments of hell. To be found a sinner before God our judge is a horrifying future. But this is where Christ, our advocate, our defender, comes in. Showing his wounds, his spilt blood poured out on our behalf. And this is how he clears us before the judge. Because his death was in our place. He paid the full penalty that our sins deserved. That the wrath of God justly was upon us. And so as the Father's wrath was poured out upon Jesus as He hung on that cross, Christ absorbed every drop of it for you. Every last drop of the wrath of God for this glorious, hopeful, joy-creating result. The fullness of His punishment was executed as He executed His Son. The totality of the penalty was paid, paid in full. No drop of that wrath remains, none of it. Not a drop will fall upon us. That means His wrath, His justice is satisfied, His wrath is gone, and so mercy is here at the cross. For any sinner, for anyone that sins, but will lean upon, rest upon, call upon the righteous Jesus to be their defender, mercy is here. He is our only hope, our only advocate. 
And as we receive full forgiveness, full mercy, we're beckoned and brought into that fellowship. And even still, God is still good. He is still just. Because He punished sin to its fullest degree. The punishment was paid. He's still a good judge. And yet He can still show mercy. So brothers and sisters, a glory in this advocate on your behalf. There is no more able defender that you could imagine. There is no better way to answer any accusation of the devil or of your heart than you could hope for than this advocate. What possible condemnation for you could still remain or be imagined if this advocate claims you? Romans 8.34 Who is to condemn? And what's the answer? Christ Jesus is the one who died, who is our propitiation, and more than that, who was raised so that He's at the right hand of God interceding for you right now if you're in Christ. And that hope and assurance this life His death gives is not exclusive to us. That is, those who already believe. This propitiating death extends an invitation to any sinner who sees their sin, but sees Christ's death as a more than adequate payment to the full for it. Hence, we see, as we keep reading in verse 2, He is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Now, theologians have wrangled over this verse as they debate the question, for whom did Christ die? For everyone or just for the elect? The question of limited atonement. Now, we know from reading this letter, or, or say reading John's gospel, whatever is meant that he is the propitiation for the sins of the world, it cannot mean that Christ has taken away God's wrath for everyone individually. Otherwise, Jesus' words in John 3.36 make no sense, which read, Whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. So however this works, Christ's death in the end only satisfies the wrath of God for those that trust in Christ, who claim Him as their only hope before God. But this much is also true. There is no sinner, no matter how grave, no how seemingly far gone, no matter how evil they seem, or how perverse they are, or no matter how habitual, there is no sinner in all the world that will find anything lacking in Jesus' death for them, if they would claim it, if they would turn from their sin and own Him and trust Him. Christ's atonement will never keep any sinner at bay if they would just confess and come. Is that not a message we need this morning? And is that not just a glorious message that we need to be reminded of as we come to this table? Because as we come, we are proclaiming the Lord's death until He comes. Because our only hope when He comes is that Jesus is our advocate, pleading His cross for us. Let's pray, and as we do, I'm going to ask the men to come forward. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this glorious gift you've given us in Jesus. That he is truly our advocate. That he is our defender. That he is interceding for us actively right now for each sinner that looks to him. That all you see in us, your church, is righteousness. Purity, blamelessness, that we are before your light. But that's only because of this glorious gift of your son and what he's done. This gift that's even given us your spirit, changed our hearts, made us to believe, and brought us into faith. What a gift you've given us. We give you glory for it. But as we come to your table, we confess our sins afresh as we see them. Pray you might even, in our midst this morning, expose our sin in our hearts, that we might turn and repent. Doing so ashamed of our rebellion, but also confident in your mercy, because Jesus' death was absolutely enough. Strengthen the faith of your people to know this. And may we go change, conform to the image of Christ, because we've been shown mercy at the cross. It's for his glory we pray. Amen.